welcome to the Small Business Council Lunch in the Know for April. We're expecting a great turnout, hopefully, of over 75 today for our Lunch in the Know. And people are coming on quickly. I hope some of you are able to enjoy this session outside in the gorgeous sunshine today. And for those of you whom I've not had a chance to meet, I'm Dottie Summerfield Justy. I serve as president of Summerfield Associates, local recruiting and consulting firm. And it is my joy to be co-chair of the Chamber's Small Business Council, along with Patricia McKinney, my right hand, right arm, right hip. Just gonna wait a couple more minutes for a few more people to log on. Hey, Amy Leahy, thank you. Good to see you too. Oh, I can't see people. Let's see what I can do here. Gallery view. Um, Tunja, are we set up um, as a webinar? If so, only the speaker can be seen or at some point will we be able to see everybody? No, Dottie, this is a webinar. Okay, good, then it is a webinar and I can't see anybody. So good, thank you very much. Um, so we're about two minutes afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. It's good to see everybody. Again, um, the Small Business Council was created by the Greater Memphis Chamber by small business for small businesses to empower Memphis small businesses with the resources that they need. Our goal, is to create the opportunity for members to share and to learn from their peers and collaborate with our think tank members to brainstorm concerning topics that are most impactful, which is why we are lucky enough to have today's webinar. And I would like to thank a few people who serve on that think tank and help set direction and topics for the Small Business Council and its meetings. Amy Austin with Amy Austin Interiors, Renee Malone of KQ Communications, Brad Fetterman with Performance Point and Michael Detroit with Playoffs on the Square are several of our Think Tank members who are with us today. At this time, I'd like to introduce Robin Winsett. Robin is the Vice President Manager for the Germantown branch of Independent Bank. Robin, can you turn your, join us? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Robin Winsett, and as Dottie said, I am the manager of Independent Bank in our Germantown location, um, and Independent Bank is very honored to sponsor the Small Business Chamber and the, especially this Lunch in the Know, because we are all so ready to have everyone get back to work. Um, we have missed seeing our customers' smiling faces in our branches every day when everybody had to retreat to their homes. Um, it's been a trying time for lots of people, but I know everybody has kind of taken this past year to reevaluate their business. And just like all of you, we've done the same thing. And we've spent this last year of COVID and social distancing, trying to come up with innovative ways to make sure that we're supporting our customers and our small businesses so that they can be ready to come back to work um, soon. A few ways that we do this is through just something as simple as our drive-through hours. A lot of people don't know that our drive-throughs, all of our branch drive-throughs are open from 7.30 in the morning until six o'clock at night. So you don't have to take time out of your work day to get your banking done. You can come before work, you can come after work. We also uh, partner with our businesses for, with a program called I Bank at Work, um, where you can offer a free benefit to your employees. Um, and they can get a free checking account through Independent Bank with no minimum balance, no monthly service fees um, account through Independent Bank. And this is something that you can offer as an employer to tell your employees, this is something that you can get just because you work with me. For our small business owners, we have been working with the SBA and uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. I think everybody has heard something about the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, but 
Robin, we lost yes. the camera. Oh no! Yes. Thank you. So, <laughs> so sorry. Um, technology is not my strong point. Um, I really like seeing people face to face. Um, but we have been working uh, with the SBA, the Small Business Program, uh, Small Business Administration for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh oh, I think technology has taken her away from us. And while she is trying to come back on, oh, the joy of technology. Um, I do wanna thank um, Independent Bank as the prime sponsor, the main sponsor for the Small Business Council. Without them and their support, we would not be able to bring you programs like this. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Patricia McKinney with the chamber, our co-chair, my co-chair, couldn't do this without her, of the Small Business Council. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Dottie, and thank you all for joining us. And now we're going to uh, turn it over to our speakers. Deborah Finney has been with the Equal uh, Employee Opportunity Commission since 1981. She has served as an investigator for 23 years before uh, becoming an outreach and education manager. Deborah is a small business liaison for the Memphis District, and in this role, she provides technical assistance to small business employers who have questions about work issues, EEOC, or its processes. And attorney Angie Davis is shareholder and also serves as chair of the Labor and Employment Group uh, for Baker Donaldson. Angie provides a business savvy yet practical advice for her clients when facing challenging workforce uh, issues like uh, discipline, termination, and leave issues under the ADA and FMLA. So today we're going to hear from attorney Angie Davis and Deborah Finney. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Let me share my screen. Can y'all see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. All right. While she's doing that, I'm just going to jump in and say I'm happy to be here today and happy to be doing this with Angie. I've known her for a few years, <laughs> maybe more years than we care to admit. Um, and I've always enjoyed uh, working with her. So I'm looking forward to presenting with her today. And I'm looking forward to presenting with you um, to be here to answer any questions you have, because we are certainly getting a ton of them. And Deb, before you all begin, can I ask everyone, if you have questions, can you either put them in the Q&A or the chat? Some of you have thrown your names and your companies into the chat. We thank you very much for that. But if you will put your questions either in the Q&A or the chat, and at the proper time, um, Patricia and I will bring up those questions for you. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, no problem. Okay, let's jump right in. So we thought we'd start by just putting together a lot of questions that we have been fielding from my perspective, from the, the um, employment lawyer that represents companies and has uh, lots of opportunities to provide advice for return to work. And then Deborah, from the EEOC perspective, a lot of advice about uh, vaccinations, remote work, return to work, ADA and religious accommodations. So we're going to kind of cover the gambit today. We do have time at the end for questions. So feel free to write your questions down, uh, put them in the chat box, and we will address them as we, we get uh, through the presentation. So let's start with question number one. How much information can I request from an employee who calls in sick in order to protect the rest of my workforce during the COVID-19 pandemic? Deb, you want to take a shot at that one? Sure. So um, during the pandemic, early on, EEOC issued guidance in like by the end of March, we had some guidance out and we had done a webinar. And EEOC recognized that based upon the CDC's assessment of the situation, that the pandemic itself would pose a direct threat, right? So our guidance goes, as we go through this, we're moving through these questions with the assumption that it is a direct threat. As more and more of us are vaccinated and we get herd immunity, that's going to drop. But yes, you can ask an employee 
um, if they're experiencing symptoms of the pandemic virus. And, you know, initially we knew the symptoms were shortness of breath, cough, fever, but that list has vastly expanded and you can get a complete list of that on the CDC website. If you get any information about that, of course, you have to keep it confidential for the ADA. A couple of other things that we have done as a law firm and that lots of my clients have done is when you have that call from the employee who says, I have COVID, I think I've been exposed to COVID, I always like to ask them, what was the date of exposure or the date of diagnosis? When were you last at work? So that we can tell, you know, when were you in the office the last time? When you were there, what are the common areas that you were in? So for example, I'm in the First Horizon Bank building downtown. So if someone on my floor tested positive for COVID, I would ask them, what floor were you on? You know, what, what did you, main areas did you use? You know, if you use the, the restrooms on the 20th floor or the conference room on the 19th floor. Uh, and then generally you can communicate that information, not attributing it to any particular person by sending an email out to the people that work in that building or that have been coming into work just to say someone who is employed, um, you know, at your company has, tested positive for COVID the last time they were in the workplace was on Friday, whatever date, and they worked on the 19th floor. And so that way you can, um, and, and I always tell them too that we've cleaned those floors and, and send in for the extra cleaning for that sort of thing as well. Um, okay, question number two. I have an employee teleworking because the person has COVID-19. May I tell the staff that this person is teleworking because of COVID-19? Deb, what do you think? So yes, you can tell them they're teleworking, but no, you cannot tell them it's because of COVID-19. Um, same for if they were just taking leave, if they were on leave because they had COVID-19. Um, you could inform the staff that needed to know that they were on leave, but not that they were on leave because of COVID-19. And one of the things we've seen, Angie, and you probably have too, with smaller employers, people figure it out. And that's okay, that might happen, but you can't confirm and you can't give that information. And sometimes you even have the employee telling people that I've tested positive, you know, and I'm home and this is what's going on. Um, that's not on you if that happens, but you still can't share that information. Exactly, and it's interesting because people are very, have different perspectives on this. Some people are very vocal about it and they want everyone to know that they have it just in case they forgot that they short conversation with somebody. They wanna make sure, you know, like, hey, and so like when that email will come out on the 19th floor at Baker oftentimes we will have people send an email around or text and go, hey, it's me, I have COVID or we'll send an email to everyone on the 19th floor to let them know. But I have actually been called in to do a breach of confidentiality HIPAA investigation at a company here in Memphis because one of their employees felt that HR had communicated to the workforce that she had COVID. She was very sensitive about having COVID. This was very early on in the pandemic. She did not want anyone to know that she had COVID, but exactly as Deb said, they figured it out, right? You're out of the workforce unexpectedly for 14 days. Your cubicle is sitting there empty. And this person um, was unable to remote work. So all of her job duties were divided among all of her coworkers. And so they figured it out that she had COVID. Plus, of course, she had texted and told a couple of her close friends. But, you know, we had to do a full investigation on that. And I was able to prove, you know, that there was no breach in HR. But that's an important thing to remember some people are very uh, sensitive about that. Mm -hmm. All right, question number three. Is an employee entitled to an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act in order to avoid exposing a family member who is at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 due to an underlying medical condition? So in this situation, you know, the CDC has uh, listed the, the high risk um, impairments and even age 65 and older and being pregnant. And so individuals who have a family member that has um, one of these um, uh, situations and is placed at a higher risk may come to you and say, hey, you know, I don't want to risk exposing my family member and therefore, you know, I'd like to telework. 
Um, and the ADA doesn't provide for that. The ADA does not require you to accommodate the individual's family member. It only requires you to accommodate the individual who has the disability, which would be your employee. Um, now, that doesn't mean employers don't offer flexible, uh, they don't have flexibility and they don't try to work with people, but it's not a requirement of the ADA to provide an accommodation because a family member has a medical situation. So that's a great word, flexible. And um, another word you're going to hear me say throughout the presentation today is what I call the slippery slope. And so an employer absolutely can be flexible. And there are certain situations where you probably need or want to be flexible. I know in the beginning of the pandemic, for example, we had people call and like, you know, someone said, my wife is undergoing breast cancer treatment and chemo, and I don't wanna come into the office because if I get COVID and bring it home to her, you know, I, it could kill her. And so while I find that most employees employers were very flexible about that early on that flexibility is going away as mm -hmm. we have herd immunity as we have people who have better access to the vaccines um, and i feel like the the companies are going to be really cracking down and having a, a greater expectation of a return to work and they're not going to be granting this uh, flexibility here but if you decide to do that you got to be careful because you can't do it for one employee and not do it for others who request it for similar circumstances. So, you know, if you have one employee who, who has that situation with a spouse who is undergoing chemotherapy, and then you have another employee who has a, you know, child with a disability, and they both ask to work remotely, at some point you, you're you going to, you know, it depends on what department, there's a lot of factors that we're going to talk about that you take into consideration to determine if remote work is appropriate for those people. But um, just remember that you have to be consistent in that so that you don't give rise to claims that you are treating people differently because of any protected class, age, race, gender, national origin, pregnancy, sexual orientation, or the like. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about remote work and telework issues. This is kind of the hot topic. We're getting lots of questions about this now because people are finally getting back into the workforce. They're wanting and expecting their employees to get back in the workforce. And I would tell you that um, I'm spending about 50% of my time doing advice work on remote work issues and uh, fitness for duty letters. So let's go with question number four, and I'm gonna break this up into a few questions. So first, as I call staff back to work, do I automatically allow someone to continue to telework because they don't want to return to work? Deb? No. <laughs> the location of the work and whether or not an employer offers telework is, you know, that is the employer's decision. But there are some exceptions that would change that. And I think we'll see that as we move into some of these questions. Yes, and one of the things that you look at, so there is no automatic thing here. You've got, if they want to continue to telework, most employers are requiring them, you know, to talk to HR, talk to their supervisor. You do an analysis, like, is this particular job one that can be done remotely? How has this particular individual performed during remote work? You know, we have some people who, who have done great at remote work. They're keeping up with their quality of work, their quantity of work. It is a seamless transition. You know, we have here at the law firm um, a document services team. And so when we dictate briefs or um, letters and whatnot, we download it and it goes somewhere in space to this document services team. I could care less whether the person on that document services team is typing my document from their, you know, bedroom in their pajamas versus in a cubicle at some Baker Donaldson office. Like to me, that doesn't matter. So I would be very flexible in making a decision if that person wanted to allow to work remotely. And some companies have decided that it's a good financial decision to allow people to work remotely. Like a lot of the big corporations throughout the United States are thinking that they can save on real estate and parking and that sort of thing if they can let people work remotely. But one of the things that we get is fear of COVID. And it's saying, I'm just scared I'm gonna get COVID. Is that enough to be a reasonable request to continue to work remotely? And the answer to that is no. Yeah. So what about someone who has a disability? Do I have to automatically grant telework as a reasonable accommodation? 
Beth? Again, again, no, you're going to do that assessment that you would do with any reasonable accommodation request. And is that, you know, you can ask that employee, what's their disability related limitation that would necessitate the accommodation, right? And then if you can provide an accommodation that allows them to be in the office or at the work site to do the job, then you don't have to provide telework as an accommodation. And, you know, we're seeing that already with um, some of our, our employees. You know, when we have our, our management meetings, we talked about it. We were in leadership retreat this week. And even among managers, a bunch of them don't want to come back. That's not an option, right? They want to continue to work at home. But a lot of the investigators say, we don't see why we need to come back to work in the office because, you know, our production is great. In fact, our production is up. Um, and everything that we accomplish in the office, we can accomplish at home. But right now, we're not allowing the public to come in and file charges. And when that happens, and when we reopen, someone has to be there to take those charges. So, you know, that we see already grumblings about that. But the fact that the agency converted to 100% telework and we were still able to get the job done doesn't mean they have to continue to do that. And we do have some employees with disabilities that are doing the, you know, I'm sort of afraid to come back because of COVID, but that's going to have to be like Angie said, assessed on a case by case basis. You know, what is your job? Where do you work? What is the issue? Is it just a fear? Then that's not really something we're going to accommodate, you know. Yeah, and one of the things you know, is that back and forth interactive process that you're required to have under the ADA. So document all of this, document phone calls, save emails. You know, why is it that you're requesting to, re to continue remote work? And then I always require a physician's note. I'm not a doctor, they're not a doctor, and boy, I'm hearing about all kinds of disabilities of people who don't want to come back. So I need proof that A, you have something that qualifies as a disability under the ADA, and I need a professional medical opinion of a physician that says that it is safer or safest for you to continue to work remotely. Um, and so that's, it's interesting because sometimes you'll talk to these employees and they'll say a good story and then you say, okay, great, get your physician to put that in writing. And then, you know, that's not at all what we get in the fitness for duty response um, from the physician. Another tip though, um, it's very important that you review your job descriptions, and if you have um, a job that does have regular in-person attendance as an essential function, that needs to be noted in your job description. Because often when I send that fitness for duty letter to the physician to say, hey, they've requested remote work, I need additional information from you, I'm going to attach a copy of that job, job description, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put in there in-person attendance is an essential function of their job. And so, for example, if somebody works in housekeeping, you can't be a housekeeper from your home. That in-person and regular attendance is required as part of that job. So make sure that your job descriptions are updated to state those essential functions. And that is, a, that is a great, that's a best practice. When we talk to employers about the ADA, we really focus on make sure your job description, your position description is accurate and truly reflects what the job requires. Absolutely. All right, question number five. Can I provide telework, modified schedules, or other benefits to employees with school-aged children due to distance learning? And what are some implications of doing so? So under EEOC's law, the laws we enforce, there's no requirement that you do this, but we are seeing a lot of employers providing those flexibilities, or as Angie likes to call them, those slippery slopes, um, to, you know, to assist their employees that are having to do this. The only um, way that EEOC looks at this is if you do that, it's fine, but make sure you're not um, giving a protected group more favorable status. For example, let's say you have, um, you know, you're granting this option to female employees because you're using that gender-based assumption that women have the caretaking responsibilities of children. But if your male employee requests this flexibility and you don't give it to them because of that, then you have a whole other issue. It's a Title VII issue and not an ADA issue. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And I mean, I think that a lot of people, this is also something that's changing. We had to do this early on in the pandemic because schools were not open, daycares were not open, there were no options. We are seeing a change in that. And the expectation is that by the time that fall gets here, we have a, a we believe that daycares and schools will be in person and open. But what we're finding is some of these parents still have fear of COVID, A, or B, they like having their kids do remote learning. Some kids excelled at remote learning and they want to continue doing remote learning. Some school districts are providing that as an option. And so even though it's not mandated uh, by any kind of uh, safer in place or whatever, if a, an employer wants to do that, again, be wary of the slippery slope that, you know, if you do it for one, you're going to have to do it for, for others that are similarly situated. And I'll give you an example of a non-COVID situation that I had for a company here in Memphis where they had engineers that worked for the company. And so there were um, several white male over 40 engineers um, who wanted to play golf on Friday afternoons. And so they would say, hey, I want to leave early on Friday afternoon. So for years, they had all left early to go play golf on Friday afternoon. Well, the newest hired engineer was an under 40 African-American male. After he'd been working there for a little while, he went through a divorce and was going to need to do uh, pick up his kids every other Friday from school. And so he said, hey, I want to leave every other Friday early. And they're like, yeah, sorry, you can't do that. And he filed a charge with the EEOC saying, you know, really, the black guy under 40 can't take off, but here's a, a litany of white guys over 40 who can take off. And when I went and talked to the employer, I'm like, well, why the distinction? And they were like, well, he was the last one that asked, and we only have a certain number of engineers working, and it is a legitimate business requirement that we have someone on site, an engineer on site for emergency. So that is a legitimate concern, but the, the proper way of handling that is then to go back and redraw your schedule and say, okay, we're going to, you know, take away all that and let's decide who's going to get what Fridays off and rotate around so that you're treating similarly situated people the same. Now, if they're in different job categories, that'll be a different analysis. But if you have people that do the same exact job and one gets to work from home to take care of the kids, then I'll have to work from home. The other thing I will say about this is, you know, we still expect the employees to work full time from home. This is not a daycare excuse. And so I put in my remote work policies that this is not a substitution for daycare, that you're still expected to be available and online and answering phone calls and all of that during normal business hours. And that you need to provide, if your kids are younger, for, for whatever child care. You can work remotely, but you don't need to be the primary child care person and be doing your job um, if that impacts the quality and the quantity of the work that you do. So the expectation is that if you perform from home remotely, just like you do um, from work, then, then you can get that performance evaluation will be the same. Right. Um, and you should be able to continue to work from home, but not an excuse for child care. All right, probably another hot topic right up there with remote work is vaccinations. Boy, we've had a bunch of questions on vaccinations, so let's jump right into this. Can I ask employees to show proof of receipt of a COVID-19 vaccination, and would doing so be a disability-related inquiry under the ADA? Now, Deb, I know the EEOC has been really good about issuing guidance on what is considered a disability-related inquiry. And, you know, two years ago, our answer would have been very different. So what's the answer today? So the answer today is yes, you may require proof of vaccination. That in itself, asking for proof of vaccination, would not be a disability-related inquiry. However, if they tell you they don't have proof of vaccination and you start asking them questions about why, that could elicit um, information about a disability. And then we would, you know, it would fall under the ADA standard that it has to be what? Job related and consistent with business necessity. So on these types of issues, I like to describe it as it's a sliding scale right now. Right now, it might be permissible to find out because that person could still be a direct threat to themselves, you know, to others in the workplace. But as more and more of us are vaccinated and we get herd immunity and that direct threat sort of goes away, then you won't be able to ask 
you know, why you don't have it if it's likely to elicit a disability, you know, information about a medical situation. So it's, it's kind of difficult to figure out depending on where we are in the pandemic. You know, it'll, it'll change, it'll change. It changed and it will change again. Yes, and our answers may change next week too as That's well. Right. Um, so always check eeoc.gov and the CDC website for a lot of these different issues. Um, the, uh, oh, and one point too, Angie, even if you say the qualification standard test is it job related and consistent with business necessity to know this, you still have to take that additional step, even if it is, can it be accommodated? You still have to go to that. Then can I do some accommodation that uh, minimizes that risk or reduces that risk? So don't forget that. And that, you know, as we slide, that will change some, but you still have to make that attempt at accommodation if you do determine there's a direct threat. So kind of a spin on this question, you know, can I ask employees to show proof is one question. Should you ask employees to show proof is another question. And I will tell you that lots of my clients are asking. They're not requiring. Um, and again, that's a very interesting feedback that we get. Half the people are very sensitive about it and they don't want to be sharing with anybody anything about their vaccination. Other people are posting all over social media, you know, holding up pictures, getting vaccinated and all of that. And so, um, but I do have employers that are asking their employees, hey, if you have been vaccinated, will you share that information with HR so that we can keep a running record of who's been vaccinated? Several employers are wanting to use this as an advertising tool. There are several schools that I represent around town that want to be able to say 100% of our um, workers, employees, teachers, every worker here has been vaccinated so that the parents feel like that would be maybe a safer place for their kids to go to school. From mm -hmm. my perspective at our law firm, we have some people who do have underlying health conditions that work here who are a little bit weary about coming back to work. And so it's been very helpful for me to be able to share with my coworkers, look, everybody on the 19th floor has been vaccinated. So when you come into our workplace, you're coming into a fully vaccinated floor. Now you can't say that if you don't know that, and you only know that and keep those numbers by collecting that data. I have one employer who is um, setting it up in their ADP system. So when people go on to sign on in the morning to sign in uh, for their time clock, it'll just say, have you been vaccinated, yes or no? And they're not requiring people to show proof, but you just say whether you have or haven't been vaccinated as a way to collect that data. Um, another question we're getting is, can or should I offer on-site vaccinations? Deb, what's the EOC think about this? So an employer can opt to do so. The EEOC doesn't say you can't, um, but there's a lot of things you need to be aware of. So we know that pre-vaccination, there's a medical screening done. And those medical screening questions are likely to elicit information about a disability. So if you have a contractor who's doing this for you on site or you're doing it on site and you do that pre-vaccination screening, um, you're going to be asking those questions then that likely will elicit information about a disability. So what do we say? To do those types of inquiries, it has to be job related and consistent with business necessity. So you would have to... Um, have a reasonable belief based on objective evidence that an employee who doesn't answer the questions um, and doesn't receive the vaccine will pose a direct threat to the health or safety of himself or others. And there's not a reasonable accommodation that you can provide to minimize um, or reduce that risk. Uh, now, whether you should or not, I think Angie can address that. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's been a great idea. And I mean, I have a manufacturing facility that's in the Jackson, Tennessee area, and they early on brought in a company to do on-site vaccinations because they had employees who were working very closely with one another in a, in a manufacturing type environment, and they wanted to encourage their people to get vaccinated. And so they said, we'll do it. You can get it done while you're here at work. Um, I will tell you that in Memphis, we did a, a survey here at our law firm last week because we were thinking, okay, we're, we're at 50% capacity now. We want people back at 100% capacity starting May 1st. And so 
we asked, we did a survey monkey just to ask employees, like if we offered online vaccination, how many people you and your family would want a vaccination and could come to the workplace to get vaccinated. And it was interesting, y'all, that most people here have already been vaccinated. In our whole office, we did not have, you had to have a minimum of 20 people that needed and wanted the vaccination to get like the on-site Walgreens people to come to your facility. And we didn't even have 20. I think that's different. You know, I do a lot of work with the ABA and it's very different. Accessibility to vaccines is very different in different states. And so, and cities even. Um, here in Memphis, boy, you can drive through the Pipkin Center and that, you know, the U.S. Army will get you in and out of there in 20 minutes with no appointment. And so, mm -hmm easy and accessible and so I find that at least within the city of Memphis um, or Shelby County, people who want to get vaccinated are already getting vaccinated. Now you have some of the anti-vaxxers who they don't care if you bring it on site or give it free at the Pipkin building or at Walgreens, they're not going to get vaccinated no matter what. Which brings me to our next, que next question, which is, you know, can I require vaccinations of all of my employees? And then what do I do if someone says that they can't get a vaccination because they have a disability under the ADA because they have some type of a, you know, religious accommodation? So what is the EEOP, EOC's perspective on whether employers can require vaccination? So we say, you know, an employer can have a standard that they want, um, that an individual should not pose a direct threat to the health or safety or someone else, right, in the workplace. So the ADA, ADA allows you as an employer to have that, but we say that's a safety-based quality standard, right? And if you have that and it screens out or tends to screen out an individual with a disability, you have to show as the employer then that the unvaccinated employee would pose a direct threat due to the significant risk, right, of substantial harm to the health and safety of themselves or others. So again, when we talk about that sliding scale, as more and more of us are vaccinated, as we get herd immunity, that's going to change um, because they may not pose a risk at all by not having the vaccine, you know. Um, and if they tell you that they don't have the vaccine because they have an underlying health condition, and there are individuals who simply cannot take the vaccine because of a medical situation, well, then if you determine that you know it is a direct threat at this point in time um, and they need to have the vaccine, what's the next step? Then you have to look at, is there an accommodation we can provide um, that would satisfy the requirement you know, and make reduce the risk of a threat that that employee can work? Um, and as we move along, um, even a month and a half ago when it was so difficult to get a vaccine, that might have been a harsher standard, right? But as we've moved into, and like Angie, we're experiencing the same thing in Little Rock. If you want a vaccine, you can get it pretty much now, right? Um, and initially, though, people were scrambling. Even individuals who were at the very top of the list to get a vaccine were scrambling to get a vaccine and couldn't. So as we move along and more and more of your employees are vaccinated and we get herd immunity and there's no direct threat, it's going to be hard for you to say that this is, you know, job related consistent with uh, business necessity to have this standard in the workplace. And, you know, you would have to approach it if an individual has a disability from an accommodation issue. Now, religion, we address that, you know, you know a little bit different than disability. Religion has a much lower standard in terms of a defense for not providing an accommodation. It's, it's much lower. And what they say is it's an undue hard. Okay. So it's either more than the minimal cost, de minimis cost, or um, significantly burdensome, unduly burdensome to the employer to allow this. Now, where the issue comes up in religion is sometimes people think the employee is making this up so they don't have to take the shot. Right. So EEOC guidance is you don't delve a whole lot into someone's religious beliefs when they ask for the accommodation, unless you have some objective evidence to indicate that that may not be the case. Example, someone is, you know, notably 
been an anti-vaxxer. Someone has said, I'm not taking the vaccine regardless. Employer says, you can't take the vaccine. You can't come to the job site. Then the employee says, well, it's because of my religion I can't take the vaccine. Well, that's some objective evidence that maybe that employee, employee is not being um, upfront and forthright with you on that. And you could delve into that a little bit more and get information about that. So that's the EEOC guidance. And my guidance is a little different than the EEOC guidance on this. Um, and my answer to this, can or should I require vaccination, is no. Um, and if you do the, the studies that are outside of the statutes that are governed by the EEOC, you will find that all of these vaccines are only currently approved for emergency use. In order to be approved for emergency use, one of the little um, subdivisions of that statute says that you cannot require people to take it. They have to have an option to not take the vaccine only when it is approved for emergency use. So my answer really should be not yet, because we anticipate for sure with Pfizer and Moderna within another couple of months, it'll be approved for full use by the FDA. Um, and so we won't be we struggling with that whole um, issue with the emergency use exception. But when we get there and it is fully approved, should you do it? Uh, I will say that the majority of my clients um, who are mandating it are going to be hospitals, long-term care facilities, and colleges, um, where you're going to have a bunch of students living together in a dorm. Just like when our kids go to college now, you have to get the meningitis vaccine or you can't live in the dorm. You're also going to have to get a COVID vaccine. At most colleges and universities, it is going to be required. Uh, Long-term care, same thing. They want to be able to advertise that every single person that works at that nursing home has been fully vaccinated. Same thing with hospitals. Currently, most of the case law on required vaccinations is in the industries of hospitals and long-term care because most of them do require the flu shot. And there are cases out there that say you, you can mandate and require the flu shot uh, for all of your employees because, back to what Deb said, it is business related, job related, and consistent with the business necessity. These people are going to be around um, patients or residents in the nursing home and they might uh, spread that. And so that's an important um, issue to keep in mind. Now this is kind of a, a question that I get a lot. Can or should I offer an incentive to employees to entice them to get the vaccine? The legal answer to that from Angie Davis is no. Um, and if you get challenged with that in court, you will likely lose that battle. Are the majority of my clients ignoring me and offering incentives? Why, yes. Yes, they are. A distribution center that I represent is allowing every employee an extra vacation day once they prove that they've been vaccinated. Instacart is offering their employees $25 to get vaccinated. Uh, Trader Joe's gives two hours of um, paid time off for each shot that they have. So they get four hours of paid time off. Um, the problem there is under some of the ERISA wellness plans, if you offer an incentive that people cannot take advantage of because of their medical condition, uh, that can cause a problem. And so like, let's say you're gonna pay a hundred bucks if you get the vaccine and you have somebody that can't take the vaccine and you have a, a doctor note saying that they you know, have bad reactions to vaccines and that it would be detrimental to their health, health, then you're discriminating against that person because they can't take the vaccine. They can't get the $100. But what a lot of my clients are doing is they're under the table. If people come forward with a legitimate doctor's note saying they can't get the vaccine and they're offering the incentive, they go ahead and give them the $100 anyway or give them the day off. Um, but they're not advertising that. But there are some issues with those incentives. But I, to be honest, I'm not seeing them get challenged. One of our um, companies that we represent is a nationwide uh, company that does, you know, gas stations everywhere. And finally, they just said, we had to do it because all of our competitors are doing it. And we don't want people choosing to stop at a different truck stop instead of our truck stop. Uh, okay, we're going to go through a few kind of odds and ends about paid leave. Can I still pay my employees under um, the emergency pay leave provision or the EFMLA and receive the tax credit? So this is kind of 
outside of the realm of the EEOC. I will tell y'all we have a great webinar on this and several alerts that were written. So if you Google, you know, the um, paid leave, emergency paid leave, Baker Donaldson, you'll get links to that. Um, but just a, a little background, under the FFCRA, if you had fewer than 500 employees, you got to give the 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave and up to 10 weeks uh, under the EFMLA, and you got tax benefits and credits for that paid leave. That expired on December 31st, but it has been um, renewed, and as of April 1st and through September 30th, employers can voluntarily, you're not required to do it, but you can voluntarily choose to extend emergency paid sick leave or EFMLA. They have also expanded the qualifying reasons to include time off to get the vaccine, time off in case you are in bed for 36 hours from side effects of the vaccine, um, or to seek results for a COVID test or to be tested, or if you think you've been exposed and whatnot. You can still get that tax credit, but again, it is entirely voluntary. Um, and so that's, this is the next question. What about if the employee is out due to reaction from a COVID vaccine as opposed to having or being exposed to COVID? Yes, under the new expanded statute, that would count. Okay, let's talk now about some changes in the workplace and return to work. I require my staff to wear PPE, masks, gloves, whatever. And I have an employee who, who has requested not to wear a mask because of their religion. What do I do, Deb? Well, that has what you have received at that point is a request for an accommodation um, on religion. And, you know, as we discussed before on religion, you have to have a, an objective belief that that's not actually a requirement for them um, because of their beliefs to challenge that. EESC says you, you know, you should accept their beliefs and go from there unless you have some factual information or objective information. And again, that could come down to, and we've seen cases like this, someone who says, you know, I don't intend to wear that. I'm not wearing it. That's not what I'm going to do. And they've, you know, made social media posts about it. They've done all of that. Then if they come to you and say, I can't wear it because I have, you know, because of my religion, you have that objective um, evidence to indicate that you can go deeper into that situation. And, you know, if someone tells you just to move it along into the, the realm of disability, there may be situations where a person um, can't wear a mask because of a disability. And at that point, you would just look at alternative um, methods of accommodation. It may require, you know, a face mask, um, different things that you can do, plexiglass uh, on their desk or their work area. So you would just need to go through the accommodation process on that. Great. Okay, question. question 13. Protocol, as more folks get vaccinated, the answer to that is yes. Follow CDC guidelines. You'll see things like the um, removal of signs that the elevators are limited to two people. You'll be able to start allowing people to be in conference rooms more often. Kind of a related question to that is, you know, what about employee travel? And I'm going to tell you that the CDC website is your friend. They have a drop-down menu that is the travel planner. So you can look at states you're going to to see if there are quarantine recommendations. Um, basically, the CDC is saying once you're fully vaccinated, you should be allowed to travel again, delay travel until you're fully vaccinated, and then um, look at the CDC recommendations. There are different quarantine guidelines if you are not vaccinated. Right. And then on one last thing, and then we're going to open it up for some questions from y'all, but are there any new CDC COVID guidelines that you need to be aware of? The answer to that is yes. And I, I'm not kidding when I tell you to check this every single day. I got an issue last week for one of the schools that I represent, and somebody called in and said, oh, I was exposed to COVID this weekend. My neighbor tested positive, and I was at a cookout with them on Saturday night, so I'm going to need to stay home for 14 days, and, and they're less than 500, so, that, you know, they're under the paid leave, and they've opted into that. And they had been fully vaccinated. And so under the new CDC guidelines, if you are not experiencing any symptoms, you have been fully vaccinated or you have had COVID in the last 90 days, you don't have to quarantine. In fact, you need to get your tail back to work. 
And so, um, you know, look at those guidelines every single day because those are, are changing kind of as we go. And then last but not least, um, and then we're going to open it up for questions. There is a COBRA subsidy. It's not really under the, the return to work thing, but I want to make you all aware of it that there's some changes um, on COBRA tax benefits and a COBRA subsidy. If you Google Baker Donaldson COBRA subsidy, you can do the webinar and see our alerts, and it'll go into the details about that. All right. I think we're going to open it up for some questions now, Dottie. I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose. Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask the first question. Um, we had a question at what point in the interview phase is an employee allowed to disclose a disability? In other words, what if someone is hired but can't perform the duties they agreed to? Can an employer move toward legal termination? Deb, I'm gonna throw this to Angie. Okay, so at what point can you ask about it? So that would be um, post offer, pre-employment, give them their essential job functions and let them tell you whether they can perform the essential functions of their job. If they say, well, I need to let you know about this disability, then you can have those um, inquiries related only to their ability to perform the essential functions of their job. Again, important for you to have a well-written job description that lists out essential functions. And in this COVID pandemic, we are finding people that say, you know, I have an autoimmune something or another, so I have to work remotely. I mean, I had a situation where an employer made an offer to a, a, a secretary to come and work, and then they called the night before their first day of employment and said, oh yeah, by the way, I need to work remotely. Well, being in person is an essential function of the job. And they didn't talk about that need for an accommodation, but we had to withdraw the offer because you got to physically be present as part of that. But to reiterate that, post offer. Mm -hmm. post -offer. And, and the wording is very specific. Can you perform the essential functions of the job? I'm not saying, do you limp? Do you this? Do you that? Can you Understand the wording. That's critical for everybody. Okay, let's, and is the EEOC being patient with complaints since it's a moving target referencing COVID issues? Um, patient and are we being lax on the enforcement? I would say no. <laughs> I mean, the law is the law and we don't get to choose how we enforce the law. But I would say that if you have a situation come up you know, I'm the small business liaison for the district. You can reach out to me. I'm sure Angie says you can reach out to her um, before. If you have a situation that you're just not sure of, please reach out before you make a decision um, and put yourself at risk. I am not, uh, I can't give you legal advice, but I can tell you based upon what you're telling me, this is what the EEOC would look at. This is what would apply. And if you do this, th you know, this would affect this. Um, so please use that uh, resource. You can reach out to me, you can email me, whatever, call me, and I'm happy to walk you through a situation. Um, is there a form that we can use for the employee to sign allowing their name to be used if a COVID positive diagnosis is present? So like, if, are you saying if the employee um, this okay, you can tell everybody that I've had COVID. Sure. I mean, if they, if they want you to, some employees want you to tell people that they have COVID. Um, others don't. So like we said earlier, I would never tell anybody the identity of anyone who has tested positive for COVID unless the employee wishes mm -hmm. that you share that information. And if that is their wish, then absolutely I would get it in writing and signed and documented mm -hmm. that they requested that you share their identity. So if anybody else that has a form that we, can, that we can use, if you can get it to us, we can pass it along to everybody. Yes, Deb. And we use that just internally as well at EEOC. You know, you work with people for a long time, somebody has a medical situation and they want you to tell other employees what's going on. We require some sort of documentation. You know, years ago, you used to see the email, so-and-so had a heart attack and they're in the hospital and, you know, it was benevolent. People wanted people to know, but, you know, we can't do that. But sometimes employees do want you to tell people. 
and you do want to document. I think you've already answered this. Can an employer require you take the vaccine shots, flu shots, and others? And I think we covered that. We did, yeah. Okay, great. Can you require employees to attend in-person meetings as part of their responsibilities if they aren't comfortable in public due to the pandemic? Yes. Yes. If it's an essential function of their job. Yes. And I think that we're going to be moving more towards that. Again, mm -hmm. as my dad said, once we get herd immunity, once people are more vaccinated, we are starting to see things open up. Like at my office, mm -hmm. we used to bring a visitor in. We couldn't have in-person depositions. I was not allowed to meet with a client. I had to do an investigation at the height of COVID, and it was like Fort Knox to allow the guy to come in here and meet with me. And we had to sit at two different ends of our conference room. We had to wear a mask. They took his temperature. He had to do a symptom check. That stuff is kind of all uh, going away. And so I think if you do have an in-person meeting where it is an essential function of your job, and let, let's say that every person, every customer service representative needs to come up here and do training and mm -hmm. sit in a training room to learn how to deal with the new training system that they're going to need to use starting on Monday, then you can require them to come in and be in attendance. Now, can you offer them an accommodation if they do have a disability or are scared or whatever and offer them a time that they could come in separately or allow them to do it remotely? You can do that as well, but you okay. also, if it is an essential function, you can require it. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple more and I'm going to try to pick and choose because I want to be mindful of everybody's time and Patricia's going to hop in in a second. Can you ask for documentation of an employee awaiting a COVID test results? For example, employee says that they were tested and won't have the results for seven days and needs to take time off or be or quarantine. Absolutely. Yes. You can ask for documentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, if employees travel for business in groups and this person doesn't want to be vaccinated, can we require frequent testing as an alternate option? Um, well, that's a medical exam, yeah. a test. So you're going to have to go through that analysis. Is it job related, consistent with business necessity? And as we move through this pandemic and things are opening up and, you know, there's less risk, I, I, that answer could vary. It could very well be a month ago, yes, you could have required it, and now maybe not, you know. I can hear people saying, but if I travel outside the country and I come back into the United States, I've got to have proof of a negative test three days before I return. Um, so a good question. Thank you, Michael Detroit. Nonprofits and other organizations use a lot of volunteers. Can we require the same of volunteers that we do of our employees? Oh, in boy. terms of, of asking for positive, negative tests, vaccine, requiring the same thing. I mean, they're not an employee as a volunteer, so they're not governed by the laws that, that Deb and I have. They're not going to be covered by the ADA and Title VII and whatnot. But as an employer, I, I would say, you know, I need 25 volunteers to work this event in order to be selected for that event. You know, I would like to know either whether you have been fully vaccinated and if not, whether you would be willing to take a COVID test, you know, 48 hours prior to the event so that you can ensure, especially if it's going to be a big event where lots of people from the public are there and you're going to want to advertise that the people who are going to be, you know, taking up money, selling tickets, doing whatever, you know, have been vaccinated. So, yes. And I'm going to ask one quick question about the EPLSA. I know that's less than 500, but is there a floor more than 20, more than 15, more than 50? It's nope. anyone under 500. And it's all voluntary now. And you do get the tax credits and you don't have to do it. But if you do do it, again, you've got to be consistent and do it for everyone. Um, next to last question. Does the right to work state even matter in any of this? In other words... <laughs> How about that sticky wicket to end this one on? In other words, can an employer use the right to work as a termination reason if employees don't agree to certain on certain COVID-related matters? Not if it's an EEO implication. Okay. So the right to work doesn't trump EEO laws. Thank you. Angie, you agree? Yeah, I mean, you know, if they say I'm an anti-vaxxer, I don't want to wear a mask, I have First Amendment rights, I mean, that's what we're hearing, which 
-hmm. in a private employer context, you do not have a First Amendment right, and I can make you and require you to wear a mask, and if you don't, I can fire you. And we have done that. Multiple employers have done that during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, your, your rights at, at some point end, end at the door in terms of your protection versus the protection of other employees. But like Deb said, as we move through this pandemic, that very well may change. Thank you both. And before I turn it back over to Patricia, we lost Robin um, as we were introducing her. Um, and I'm going to jump in and remind everyone, especially those of you who run your small businesses. Um, the extension to file for the second round of PPP has been extended to May 31st. Is that right, Robin? You can unmute for just a second. For that those of you correct. who have not filed and are considering, the deadline has been extended to May 31st. Thank you. Guys, thank you all so much. I appreciate Deb, Angie, for being here and everyone for participating and for your wonderful questions. Patricia, thank you, my friend. Thank yeah. you. And, and Angie and Deb, you were so thorough. All the questions that I got were the same things that you all presented. So thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, mark your calendars for March, I'm sorry, May 25th, that we will have a great uh, uh, diversity and inclusion and how it impacts your bottom line. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.